have so much, who need someone to champion for them a living wage, affordable housing, and dependable transportation to work. Let equity, fairness, healing, and wholeness be the language and thoughts that guide our work. Help us to balance our deliberations, deal-making, meetings, and calls with a deeper sense of what is important. Rest, vacation, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our families, mimosas, and naps. That we make the most of each day and take nothing or no one for granted. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And thank you, Reverend Pritchett, and happy birthday this weekend, I understand. Yes, thank you. A big one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have some presentations. Oh, sorry. We have a human trafficking proclamation and a uh, crowd of people to come on up here, including Celeste and Daisy and everyone, Paul and all y'all. All right. Okay. And of course, I forgot to bring this, the list of names, so I might have to have y'all introduce yourselves. Okay. Um, it says here, I'd like to ask the staff of Human Rights, uh, Office of Human Rights, Human Services, and the Department of Children and Families. Celeste Fernandez, uh, to join me at the podium. Thank you. Uh, it is far too easy to believe slavery to be an incident of bygone eras instead of today's reality for millions of people across the world. The United Nations Global Report on Trafficking of Persons for 2018 reports that human trafficking has increased 38% since the United Nations first started collecting and reporting such data in 2007 and I believe it's very underreported. The United Nations Global Report on Trafficking of Persons for 2018 also indicates that 70% of the victims of human trafficking are women and girls. As a consequence, the majority of victims of human trafficking are trafficked for the purpose of being forced into unspeakable acts of sexual abuse. Florida consistently relate, excuse me, consistently ranks as one of the top states to receive calls and tips through the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and victims of human trafficking in Florida are trafficked from all corners of the world, including China, Thailand, Vietnam, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Micronesia. In March 20, 2016, Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners enacted its own anti-human trafficking ordinance to help combat this pernicious evil. In 2019, the state of Florida enacted Chapter 2019-152, an act relating to human trafficking, to likewise address the evil of human trafficking throughout the state of Florida. Pinellas County Commu Consumer Protection continues to inspect adult use establishments, massage establishments, and specialty salons performing nail services under the ordinance to ensure they comply with the ordinance notice and posting requirements. The Human Trafficking Symposium hosted by Pinellas County Human Services in January 2020 is a further testament to the county's commitment to the eradication of human trafficking. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that January 2020 be recognized as Human Trafficking Awareness Month in Pinellas County. And I have a couple of proclamations. One for, I think, my DCF person. And Paul, you get, yeah, no, you guys can fight over this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. And I guess we're going to take a picture.
Okay, if I can remember how to read, do we have another one here? Uh, for Lincolnshire Cooperation Proclamation. And we have the Executive Counselor of Economy and Place, the Lincolnshire Executive Counselor of Economy and Place, Colin Davey and his wife Vanessa to join me at the podium. Okay, hey, none of you guys are his wife. Okay, all right, gotcha. <laughs> okay. okay, and I'll just read the proclamation. The counties of Pinellas and Lincolnshire share a long history. U.S. Army Air Corps pilots and crews trained in Pinellas County, having, sta having been stationed at Royal Air Force bases in Lincolnshire during World War II. Lincolnshire. England, Great Britain. Okay. The economies of Pinellas and Ligature each include a strong presence of companies in the aviation, aerospace, and defense industry sectors. Florida and Great Britain are important partners in export and import trade. Your Florida origin exports, with Florida origin exports to the United Kingdom exceeding $2 billion per year. Both counties share a common love of breweries. <laughs> yes, we do. With Lincolnshire serving as home to Bateman's Brewery, one of the oldest in the United Kingdom, and Pinellas being the home of Gulp, Gulp Coast Craft Beer Trail with over 35. Who writes this stuff anyway? <laughs> You're just doing this to mess with me. With over 35 local craft breweries. Tourism is a leading component of the economies of Lincolnshire and Pinellas, with each hosting in excess of 15 million <coughs> visitors annually. Both counties have strong institutions of higher education with large numbers of foreign student enrollments. Pinellas and Lincolnshire each have significant cultural institutions and museums with collections suitable for cultural exchange and increasing tourism. Each county is located in a coastal environment that must be preserved for tourist and resident use while addressing the many issues associated with sea level rise. That now therefore be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Pinellas County, Florida, does hereby express its desire to promote cultural, education, educational, and economic exchanges and cooperation between the institutions, businesses, and citizens of our two regions, and encourages such organizations and individuals throughout the county to facilitate interactions, collaborations, and partnerships in the fields of art, culture, tourism, trade, technology, education, and investment to the mutual benefit of our two economies. And so thank you. Looking forward to lots of exchange. Would you like to say something? Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you uh, very much uh, for the proclamation today. As you've rightly said, the uh, UK is the single biggest investor in America, and the US is the single biggest investor in my country. Uh, last year, uh, America imported services and goods to Lincolnshire in excess of $750 million. And uh, we sold back into the U.S. something in the region of $450 million. The uh, Lincolnshire has a long history with America in terms of how this country was founded. Some of the greatest people uh, who uh, explored and colonized America came from Lincolnshire. Just to name a few, John Smith, who founded Jamestown. Anne Hutchinson, who was involved in the founding of Rhode Island, many of the Pilgrim Fathers. Uh, we did imprison them all in the port of Boston in Lincolnshire before we let them uh, sail here. And obviously people like the Reverend John Cotton, who will be famous in uh, American history. So we have a long and shared historical past. Um, Lincolnshire is a, a very old place. Uh, we have history going back over 4,000 years. It was an old Roman city. 
uh, at the heart of the county. Uh, and I'm sure that the cultural exchanges you mentioned, Madam Chair, are something that would be of great interest to, to people here. We do have the only touring version of Magna Carta uh, housed in our vault at Lincoln. And at one point in the future, I hope it makes its way down to your wonderful county here. And as said, tourism is a massive opportunity for uh, our two areas to grow. Every British tourist to Pinellas spends four times more than visitors from other parts of the world. So we want to see more of my uh, tourists coming over and enjoying your beautiful beaches and hospitality here. Uh, but finally, I would say the point you raised at the end regarding sustainability, we have threatened coastlines. Our coastline in Lincolnshire is the most threatened coast in the entire United Kingdom. Your coastline is indeed threatened by rising sea level and storm surge. And we're doing a lot of research with our universities and I think our cooperation between our areas about how we combat that in the future will be very, very important. So thank you all today for the proclamation. I look forward to working with the economic development team here at Pinellas and working with the commissioners and working out how we can further our cooperation and relationships in the years ahead. So thank you. Thank you. Well, this will be an exciting partnership. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and we appreciate you coming all the way over here to, <laughs> to meet with us. And there you go. Oh, wonderful. No kidding. All right. All right. Anybody else like to say anything, Michael? Just say, uh, we've been working with Colin for over three years, and every time we communicate, we find something else that we could do together. And one of the most recent, just in our most recent conversation, is Nova Southeastern University, the medical school that was recently opened here in, in uh, Pinellas County. They've just added a medical school to their university. So uh, we've got, you know, every time we get together, there's something else. So we're excited about the opportunities. Let's use this. Boy, I'm terrible at this. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Come on. Guys are rock stars. <laughs> okay. Our marketing and communications department works around the clock to build community trust and empower citizens with important information. Staff's outstanding job on two recent public education campaigns was recently recognized at the local and state levels. Those cam campaigns were the Red Tide Crisis Communications Response and the Kayaker Rescue Media Event. Uh, to keep our residents informed about the impacts of Red Tide in late 2018, our communications professionals convened an internal team and managed media relations, social media, video, and event production and bilingual messaging to keep our residents safe. Their efforts achieved 100% positive or neutral media coverage of the county's red tide response and significant citizen participation on social media, which is amazing in itself. Then in February 2019, the team planned a media event to reunite a rescued kayaker with the regional 911 center dispatcher who helped save his life. The event garnered coverage by all media 
major local media and even landed the county a spotlight in Good Morning America. Really? They forgot to tell us about that. Um, <laughs> all told, more than one million people across America saw this impactful story about our dedicated 911 employees and their use of technology to save lives. The awards presented today are the Florida Public Relations Association's Award of Distinction for each of the campaigns for achieving the standards of ethical and professional public relations. Okay. The Judges Award for the Red Tide Crisis Communications Response for achieving maximum impact with minimal cost to taxpayers. That's stuck. Okay. And an award of excellent from the excellence from the local chapter of the Public Relations Society of America for the Red Tide Crisis Communication Response. In Pinellas, our vision is to be the standard for public service in America. Congratulations to our marketing and communications team for setting the standard for government communications. Thank you very much. I'm Barbara Hernandez, Director of Marketing and Communications, and I will let um, the rest of my team introduce themselves. Um, but I just want to thank uh, the board, our county administrator, um, our leadership, and all of our departments that team up with us to put together these campaigns. Um, the Kayaker Rescue one was put literally in, within 72 hours. Um, and it landed us that spot on Good Morning America. So it's very dedicated staff working collaboratively. And so we appreciate all of the support. And I will let our team introduce themselves. Thank you. Arelis Escalera, Community Outreach Coordinator. Bruno Rivera, Video Specialist. Julian Hills, Public Information Specialist. Ashley Johnson, Senior Communications Coordinator. Tony Fabrizio, Senior Public Relations Coordinator. Andy Rather, a video specialist. Fetty has a faith for social media specialist. All right, and thank you guys so much. You really are rock stars. You make us look good every day. All right, and from our, for our partner presentation, I'd like to call up Mike Sutton, the President and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Pinellas and West Pasco Counties. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Do oh, I, you don't need that. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Um, this, this is fitting that the Marketing and Communications Department was just recognized as we're going to actually kick off our presentation with a very short video that was produced by your Marketing and Communications Department. Jojo Rodriguez Caraballo and her family enjoy life in Pinellas County's Ridgecrest community. She's living the American dream in a home that she owns. In the past, it's been a challenge renting and finding an affordable place to live. With us growing, we had to always move to make the house fit for our growth, and so it was always some kind of complication. Jojo moved into her home in late 2018. This house is in her budget and adequate for her four kids. It's possible due to a long-standing collaboration between Pinellas County and Habitat for Humanity. Sherry Harris of Pinellas County's Community Development Department says the relationship with Habitat for Humanity has been essential to the county's goal to secure housing that's affordable for residents. Habitat has been a great partner of Pinellas County. They have provided homes to families that are under 80% area median income, so they really are affordable. And these are families that maybe would not be able to afford home ownership otherwise. The program provides zero interest mortgages to residents who qualify. To receive their keys, 
homeowners must also perform at least 350 hours of sweat equity, which is hands-on participation in the construction of their home or someone else's home. Mike Sutton, CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Pinellas and West Pasco, says significant progress can be seen in the greater Ridgecrest and Dansville areas. Between those two communities, we've already completed close to 50 homes, um, and we have another uh, about 10 to 12 slated um, in the course of the next 12 months. We have really seen that neighborhood and the values in that neighborhood go up drastically. The 35-year Pinellas County Habitat Partnership has produced nearly 600 homes throughout Pinellas County. The Board of County Commissioners are some of the most supportive elected officials that we come across. So the partnership we have with the county is key. Sutton believes affordable housing creates proud residents who live in the communities where they work and help the area thrive by generating property tax revenues. We're just proud of the fact that we're able to help these families become homeowners for the first time. We're also able to help them build equity in their life um, by owning their own home. Um, and they would never be able to qualify for a traditional mortgage through a bank. Um, and so the program is, is key to you know, breaking that cycle of poverty you know, for the 50 to 70 families we serve on an annual basis. JoJo says that instead of spending so much of her time looking for places to live, she has more time to grow her own business. Some people think it's too good to be true, and they think that there has to be a catch. There isn't. It's just good people doing good deeds. It's just a great program. I do think Barbara and her team will be up here accepting an award next year for that award-winning video. Uh, um, in all seriousness, we just wanted to thank all of you uh, for the continued support of Habitat for Humanity. Um, we're celebrating 35 years this year in our community, and the work that is done on a regular basis to provide home ownership would not happen if we did not have elected officials who were supportive of our program. Um, Habitat has gone through some, some uh, massive growth over the last few years. Uh, we're now the, set, well, actually the third largest Habitat affiliate in the entire country out of over 1,240 affiliates. Um, and, be, and that's because of the continued support we received from the community. This past year, we completed 62 homes and we're on track to do 70 in 20, what is this, 2020. Um, as I mentioned last year, uh, th this is some of the results that you see that we've been able to, to accomplish in our community. We also have been doing home repairs throughout Pinellas County as we have an aging housing stock that needs it. Um, because of the county's uh, partnership with us, uh, we've received close to $1.5 million in SHIP funding. Um, those subsidies help us to bring um, home ownership to families that would not normally qualify. It also helps with subsidies um, in communities where the appraisal may not be as high or were needed uh, for uh, demo demolition or uh, property acquisition uh, costs. Um, two of the, our focus areas at Habitat for Humanity are, um, are in the Dansville community and the Ridgecrest community. Um, and really, uh, the, the main reason for that is because of the, the influence the county has had with that. So as you all know, the Dansville community was an area that um, up until a few years ago saw very little development. There was uh, about 70, uh, uh, 70 vacant parcels in this community. We partnered with the county um, on uh, building 20 homes uh, over the last two years in this community. And you'll see at the very bottom of the map there, there's some blue um, shaded boxes. Um, those are homes that are, are matched with homeowners and will start in the very next, uh, very next uh, few weeks. Um, and so we'll bring six new homeowners into that community. The homes that we were building in this community three years ago, the first few, um, were appraising at about $160,000 each. Um, the last few homes we've built, including JoJo's, appraised at over $235,000. So the home values in this community in a short amount of time have raised significantly. Um, and we've brought 20 new taxpaying citizens on the rolls. So you're welcome. Um, <laughs> Here's some photos. Uh, there's a number of you in a few of these photos. I know Janet um, and, and Commissioner Seal, you both were out for one of our groundbreakings in, in Dansville. And uh, Commissioner Gerard has been to, I think, every dedication we've done in this community. Um, so again, um, it's great to see the smiles on all the families' faces as they receive the keys. Um, all these families are doing extremely well and have built a, a community um, with, with the established neighborhood in, in, in Dansville. This, um, I stood before you last year sh uh, sharing that this is probably one of my most proudest accomplishments as the CEO of, at Habitat. 
Um, the county approached us about two years ago about taking seven vacant parcels in the Ridgecrest community and developing seven single family homes. Um, I never turn anything down that's free. So I said, heck yeah, we'll, we'll, build, uh, we'll build those houses. Um, in, in the coming months, we actually put together about 25 lots that we purchased in this community. And this has been transformational for the Ridgecrest area. The county came in and did some uh, uh, street improvements, uh, sidewalk improvements. Um, I think uh, uh, Administrator Burton, this was one of your very first visits when you started with the county. Uh, we were out looking at, at the work that had been done there. Um, we're also excited that we're under contract to buy about six more parcels um, in this uh, couple block radius. Um, at the end of the day, um, uh, it's about an $8 million investment in new home construction that's taken place. And again, rising um, um, uh, value of, of property in this community. Um, this has been a uh, generational community that has been there uh, for 100 years. And so they were very welcoming and engaged with the habitat process. And um, it's, it's been, again, just transformational to see some of the work that's taken place here. Um, we would not be able to have built the homes in Dansville and Ridgecrest if the, the county staff hasn't been so willing and embracing of our mission. Um, a, a partnership that a few years ago, um, it, we were, it was a little slow to get through the permitting and zoning process, um, is, is now at a place where we, our staff, um, really value and, and enjoy working with the county because you guys are responsive and look at us like a true partnership. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, what we're uh, excited to do here today, um, and uh, a number of our board members and staff are here, um, mainly because they wanted to get a photo with all of you. Um, but I'm going to ask our staff and our, our board chair, Alfredo Anthony, uh, immediate past chair, Jason Clement, and board member Amy Reddig, and a number of our senior staff are here. Um, we're here to present you with our annual tax check. So our homeowners last year paid $858,000 to the tax base. We're quickly approaching the million dollar number. We know we will be over that next year. Um, but again, um, thank you all so much for the continued support of the Habitat mission. That's great. And you already got this money, so if you know. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least of presentations, we have a uh, Pure Pinellas presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. We, uh, we've tried to, um, one, we appreciate the opportunity to continue doing it this year and um, try to find things that are uniquely Pinellas to share with you. And today we have a really interesting presentation. Pinellas is all about art and culture, and we all are all about uh, uh, expanding our tourism base. But we're also about supporting local businesses and our artists, and our food. And today we have a combination of all those things, and we're really how, uh, proud to have Mr. Bill Brown, who is the founder and the best title of job ever, Chief Chocolate Officer <laughs> at William Dean Chocolates in Bel Air Bluffs, 
who's going to come and talk about his business, yeah, how it was founded in 2007, and it's named in honor of his fa fa the founder's father, William, and grandfather, Dean. And now William Dean Chocolates follows the artisan tradition of creating everything they make by hand in small batches without preserves and has a worldwide following. So we want to welcome Mr. Bill Brown. That sounds pretty good, actually. So I think most of it's true. Um, first, thanks for having me here. I'm, I was going to say I, I love talking about my favorite thing, which isn't William Dean chocolates. It's chocolate. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But I first have to say, you know, we've had a lot of, we've been fortunate to have success. And so much of it I trace to the people in the area. The, we've had such an unbelievable support from the media from magazines, newspapers, and, and I can really see what a difference it is to be embraced by your community. And it probably helps to sell something they want to eat, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I thought maybe I would show something. It's a video. A few years ago, a local filmmaker came to me and said, I want to make a free video for you because he was wanting to use it to, to develop business by going to other companies. And he said, this is your story. And I didn't believe him, but uh, um, finally, you know, I thought, well, maybe what's the worst he can do? I'm not going to pay for it. And uh, he turned out to be quite the artist. He, end, he ended up later on filming at uh, uh, the Cannes Film Festival. Um, he, uh, he's selling houses today, but he's an uh, in, uh, incredible artist as far as what he can do with film. And when you see this, just so you understand, for one day I just sat in a chair and answered questions. He just rapid fired me. The next day, he just took photos or video, and then he put it all together, and I was just amazed at his quality. But I, if you haven't seen our chocolates or how we make them or maybe some of the stories, I thought this was a great way to show it to you. Plus, it's really something that I got from the community that really supported us. And it's, it's, when Whoopi Goldberg saw it, she wanted to do a reality show with us. <laughs> Unfortunately, I said no, but, uh, you know, it was... It, it was really the reminder to me then that it's, you know, you can make a great product, but it's really the, the way you interact with your community, how they embrace you, that really leads you to success or failure. So hopefully they can hear me um, and can show the video. I'm William Brown, and I'm very happy to say I'm a chocolatier. The thing that I like most about my job is that I get to share my creativity with other people. And when they come in, when customers come in for the first time, they get to hear our story, they get to see our chocolates that they've never seen. And we're not, to me, we're not just selling chocolates. We're, we're, part of, we're becoming part of this community, and we're building relationships with people and I get excited every time I talk about chocolate. I'm fortunate to be in a job that day to day, when I deal with my customers, I get to share my passion with them, not just my product. The way we do things today is not much different from the first day when I opened the sh uh, shop and it was me and a few bowls and no customers. Um, we still are artisans and what that really means is we, we do everything in small batches. We don't use preservatives. Um, we have you know some bigger machines and things that help us a little bit, but at the heart the recipes are the same. We still just, instead of making one bowl of a particular flavor, we might make four or five but we stay true to those artisan roots that we had because I think that's part of what made our first chocolate special and I don't want to give that up. So we'll never be a company that you'll see, you know, gigantic bowls and machines that do the work. It's always going to be done by hand. We still um, paint every mold by hand that we air and we airbrush it. We still use brushes. We don't try to take shortcuts. Um, it does take longer and, it, and, and that makes a difference probably in how we sell our chocolate. But at the end of the day, when I look at those pieces of chocolate, the ones coming out today look just as good or better than the ones that I made when I first opened the shop. Nothing's changed except maybe the number that we make. 
Um, a lot of times people ask me how I got here, and I try to get a good answer, but honestly, if you'd asked me years ago, this, this would never have been on the 100 jobs I thought I might do. I thought I'd be a baseball player, I thought I might be an attorney, I studied to be a teacher, and sometimes it feels like when I go on vacation and I'm trying to find this beautiful spot and I get lost, and sometimes when I get lost, I find myself in a place that's better than what I was looking for. And when I come to work every day, that's kind of how it feels. I don't know how I got here, but I just know I'm in the right spot. William Dean Chocolates is an affordable luxury. It's nice to be the kind of gift that somebody can give that is special, that people don't expect, uh, that has a sense of wonder when they get it. And, and that's what we are. I mean, you maybe aren't buying the houses and cars you're used to, but you can still indulge in something that's really the top of the line in what it is and I always hear that you know when people first open the box they're just this sense of wonder because they cannot believe that it's it's edible that it's chocolate so hopefully that shows a little bit about how we do it and I always hear from people about the chief chocolate officer um, and the reason that title is there is I actually came to Tampa area to kind of start my second career. I'd been a dot-commer in Atlanta in the 90s and all those highs and lows that come with that. And I just decided I need to go to a big company where I can prove myself and rise through the ranks. And I came here and started at Ceridian Benefits Company. And I had to actually start on the bottom as a phone person. But in five years, I was running the department. But somewhere along the way, chocolate got in front of me. And after years of, I didn't fight for titles, but everybody else did. If you turned your back and they could, you know, I just got tired of titles and people thinking that's what business was about. Because to me, it was about taking care of your customer. So that's why I came up with Chief Chocolate Officer, because <laughs> it, it's kind of a stab at my past. But uh, uh, like I said, we, you know, we've been so fortunate. Um, it's going on 13 years now, and I have no past in food. I mean, I learned it all as I went and I have been fortunate to win. You know, we've won a lot of awards and uh, I'm afraid to ask how many, pe how many people haven't had them, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and, we, and we've started to add new things like gelato and pastries. We're about to add breakfast and some other things, but um, I, I really feel lucky every day when I think about it because I've had friends that started businesses in other cities. And when I started it, I felt like it was the right location, that we had the right customer base for, you know, it is, as I said, it's an affordable luxury, but, you know, our chocolates, we use the best chocolate we use. I have three or 7,000 pounds of purees coming from France right now, so we import uh, orange peel from Italy. So I don't take shortcuts, because I think, for me, I want to put the best product out there I can, and if it costs a little more, it's not for everybody then, but it, it tastes, when you taste it, it's really the best that can be done. And, and we've been recognized as one of the top 11 chocolate companies in the world. Um, so we've been really fortunate, and I kind of laugh sometimes because we nationally are really well known, and sometimes, I, you know, locally, I, I do feel like people, I feel very proud that I, I have people think that we're kind of a local treasure sometimes. I get that from people. But, um, you know, I, again, just wanted to, uh, share a little bit of the story. I don't know if I missed anything, if anybody has any questions. or. Well, I can't believe you didn't mention Hunger Games, but... Well, you know, <laughs> you know I had nothing to do with matter. it, honestly. Yeah, we were in the Hunger Games. Actually, we were in Hunger all the movies. Um, we've been on The Tonight Show. Um, I was supposed to be on Shark Tank, and thank goodness oh, that wow. fell through. Because um, <laughs> they would have they eaten me alive. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, we've been very fortunate. You know, you make your, you know, I believe there's luck out there. There's good luck and there's bad luck. And people who are successful usually say it, it's all good work. But I, I know we caught some good breaks. The Hunger Games, they just happened to be at a shop that carried our chocolates. The food stylist saw it, bought them, put them in the movie. And I was at the movie theater, had no idea they were in the movie. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they filled the whole screen for about a second. Wow. And uh, so that didn't hurt. That's cool. And, uh, you know, I should have taken Whoopi up on the, the reality show, but the, the challenge there was you never know what they're going to put on there. Although I did offer I don't mind being a Kardashian for a few years if I can have a Kardashian bank account. But, uh, uh, but any, and the other thing that I, I, I do want to share is 
it's great for me because it's a, it's a dream for me to do this job. Uh, but even bigger than that, I have about 15 to 20 employees. And so I'm giving them a chance to do what they want to do. And they get to do stuff. Our shop is, is uh, you know, there's maybe 15 or 20 in the country that do things like we do. I mean, there's other chocolate companies locally, but the techniques we use, um, the product we use, it, it's, you know, I, I always tell people it's like cars. There's, you know, Mercedes and BMW or maybe a step above a lot of cars, because, and they cost it. And that's kind of how we are as a chocolate. It's not that we're necessarily better. I love C's, but we are using chocolate that costs 10 to $15 a pound, not 2 to $3 a pound. So anyway, thanks again for having me here. And if, yeah, if there's any questions at all, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I appreciate it. So I, I feel guilty I haven't been here before. <laughs> Where have you been? Huh? Where have you been? Well, uh, yes. Been busy. Um, this time of year, Valentine's Day, oh, yeah. it's a little crazy right now. And uh, again, like I said, uh, every year I keep waiting for the kind of the shoe to fall. Like this will be the year people forget about us. And we just got run over at Christmas. So it's, it's a bad feeling, but it's a good feeling. Uh, I hate saying no to people, but it's nice that, that people still come to us. Congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. I want to thank you so much, and I want to mention to you all, um, if you haven't had a chance, they have a wonderful tea. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I've had the occasion to actually make chocolate Ooh, bars too. there That's before so a couple fun. of times. And Do what? I, I had a chance make my to make chocolate, chocolate bar. bars. Oh, with them? Yeah. Huh? No's not in my vocabulary. So <laughs> when people ask me, like they don't even let me really talk to the people asking for donations anymore. But somebody years ago said, "Oh, can we come back in your your kitchen and have beer and wine and food?" And I said yes. And so it's evolved into this thing where maybe once a month we we cook all day and. We set up little tables in back, and usually it's it's almost usually, always you know banks or wealth advisors or doctors, and and uh, the food's pretty good. And then at the end of the the night, they make chocolate bars. Well, and how come we never heard of that before, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> we have well, now. it was a charitable fundraiser. Yeah. Well, yeah. Habitat for Humanity has yeah. done it a couple mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, and we've done charity events, and I'm always open to that. I have two nieces with cystic fibrosis, so we raised. Mm. Uh, you know, not, I mean, over $10,000 once and, and for hospice in one night in our kitchen, they raised over 120000 oh, nice. So <laughs> it's, it's, it is good for that because the people who have done everything have not made chocolate bars in the kitchen right. and eaten food <laughs> and wine. So the, the people that gave the big checks told me it was their most, the most fun they'd ever had at a, a charity event. How fun. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. We uh, really appreciate you being right, here. Thank you so much. Okay, next up we have citizens to be heard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. And first up is Tom Cuba. I'm sorry, these are only. Yeah. Yeah. Does this mean? Good afternoon, Tom Cuba, 3761 First Avenue North, St. Petersburg. Um, uh, you have two gentlemen that work for you. One is named Tom Washburn and the other one named Dennis McDuffie. And I won't take a lot of time. I had, uh, I had a need of their services a little while back, and today I thought I'd take uh, two or three hours of my time and 45 seconds of your time to let you know that they were professional and polite and very efficient and effective. It was marvelous. So you got a lot of big stuff going on today, but at the same time, I just want to remind you that you've got people who help a different citizen every 15 minutes. And that makes a great county. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Ms. Kibbe. <laughs> right. Thank you. Oh, it's really good to hear good things once in a while. Um, <laughs> Stacy Pitts. David. Hello. My name is Stacy Pitts, and I am one of the five board members of Save Bardmore. And I am here today along with a couple other people, Lisa Erisman and also Kathy Fairbanks. And I am here to say thank you for your purchase of the Bay Point Golf Course in Seminole. Thank you for your commitment as leaders. 
Thank you for your commitment to protect open green space, and thank you for doing what is right by our, by our county. Thank you also for upholding the goal of the comprehensive plan in terms of protecting recreational open space. As with any major decision, we realize there is a team of county staff and that are behind the scenes, so we also thank them. In an effort to not overwhelm the chamber this afternoon, I was selected as the voice of a community represented by hundreds and hundreds, and I know you have heard from many of them, uh, at, from the community of county supporters. We all applaud your decision. Your vote helps further our cause and message of protecting the open green space still remaining in Pinellas County. Thank you also for recognizing the vital natural role that green space plays in the management of stormwater and the treatment of runoff among the many other benefits for wildlife and for residents' quality of life. While every property and situation is unique, your plan for the Bay Point property is a model for proactive stewardship and we thank you. I've lived in this county most of my life and I've seen it change drastically in so many ways and so many positive ways. Pinellas County is a wonderful place to live and it will continue to be amazing if we have strong leaders who are wise about development and preservation. Again, thank you for your commitment to this county and for your leadership. And on behalf of Save Bardmore, we thank you. Thank you. Okay, next to be heard is uh, William Toner. Board members, just go yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, My name is William Toner. Uh, I represent the Tamarack by the Gulf uh, National Historic District Designation Project. Tamarack by the Gulf is an early <coughs> HOA community that is seeking recognition on the National Historic Registry. This idea came about a year ago, and with the permission from our community, we moved forward with an application for eligibility to the State of Historic Preservationist, Max Iberman. Uh, it was determined on June 3rd, 2019, that Tamarack of the Gulf was, by the Gulf was indeed eligible to be listed on the National Registry of Historic Places under Criterion A for a significance at the local level as a mid-century planned retirement community. And it is also eligible for listing under Criterion C at the local level for its well-maintained deed-restricted ranch houses. On an, uh, on an interesting note, we are the first HOA community seeking designation in Florida. HOA communities are so co commonplace now today that we often forget there was a time 50 years ago when they didn't exist. We are presently in the process of mapping and photographing all of the homes and buildings. We bring this forward to the board because of the significance of Bay Point Golf Course. When determining the district outlines, Max Ibmerman concurred with Pinellas County Historic Planner Tom Schofield that Bay Point Golf Course should be included in the historic district for two reasons. First, as you can tell from the satellite photos, um, that Bay Point has been an integral, integral part of Tamarack from its inception. Second, a stronger case is made for the National Registry that does not uh, like donut holes in the middle of their districts. Since the county is in the process of purchasing Bay Point, we thought it important to bring our project to their notice so that they might consider us in their plans for their development. I, stay along, I, along with many others, are pleased with the county's plans for Stormwater Park. It's a progressive view that benefits many aspects of Pinellas County residents and ecology and conservation of natural resources. There are a few concerns that our community that we hope uh, the county will take into consideration as their project moves forward. First and foremost, we are concerned that a fence might be erected on the borders of the Stormwater Park and Tamarack Housing. Bay Point has been considered and used by many of our residents like their backyard, from walking out their back doors and playing golf to walking their dogs, bicycling, jogging, bird watching, and generally enjoying the nature that this long needle pine and oak savanna provides. When the property fell into disrepair from former owners a few years ago, it was many Tamarack residents that helped clean up the mess from Hurricane Irma. Uh, <laughs> second, we are concerned that the conservation and preservation of wildlife 
resources on the property, we recommend that the water engineers contact the Federal Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, St. Pete, to get an opinion on habitat and enhance the water project. Third, it was noted that there's a $50,000 annual maintenance fund, and we wonder if this is including mowing. Mr. Toner. That's about it. Um, not quite sure what to do with that. Staff will take it and we'll, we'll okay. have to review it. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Ben Wam. Is that how you say your last name? Wam, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, what I am bringing here is um, something I was hoping not to have to bring to the board. I work for uh, Pinellas County. I work for uh, down at South Cross. I've been there about 14 months. Since I've been there, I've been threatened, intimidated, overall just made to just disregard what I'm supposed to be there to do. I have supervisors that are disregarding everything as far as we've I've had multiple situations there. I brought it up to supervisors. I'm not asking you guys to look into this. I'm just giving this as a letting you know what's going on with South Cross. Um, on December 2nd, I was um, doused with um, raw sewage, best way to put it. Um, since then, uh, I've been I've had more issues with the supervisory staff. I've been lied to about different things. Um, I've been uh, Megan Ross, um, Ivy Drexler, just to name two of them. Um, we've got Chuck Fry, uh, Mark uh, Stample, and um, Mike Seal. All three, of the, all five of these personnel have done different operations. Uh, that I just have never understood why they're happening. I know I'm new to the county. I've only been here a short time, but I've been working most of my life. I do know what's going on. And to have some of the things to be threatened and intimidated by supervisors is totally inappropriate. I've talked to HR, I've talked to um, Rodney Marion, I've talked to everybody I can to get this situation taken care of. Nobody seems to want to take care of this for me. I'm not saying you need to, but I'm just letting you know what's going on at South Cross. There's, and I'm not the only one who's having this issue because there, there are several of us there having many, many issues with what's going on. And the thing with the uh, December 2nd when I was doused or submerged in sewage, um, you know, that was a situation that shouldn't have even happened. Three supervisors knew about this situation, knew that the valves were bad. I had even taken them out there, shown them the valve. Subsequently, approximately two weeks later, that's when the accident happened. I got doused, submerged, drowned, whatever you want to say, with raw sewage. It should not have happened. They knew about this situation, but did nothing to help me. When I brought it to their situation, the only thing I was told was shut up and get to work. So these are the situations I'm bringing up to you that's going on at South Cross. It's not a good situation. If someone needs to seriously take some time and look at this. I'm not saying you, you folks, I don't know who, but somebody needs to come in and take a look at what's going on there. This is getting out of control. I've gotten two months now where I still have not gotten right. And it's, it's getting out of control. So I am, okay, I'm done, but thank you. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Okay. Next up is Jerry Tetro. That's Tetro. My name. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for allowing me to to speak with you directly. I'm going to read this to stay within the time restraints. 
My name is Jerry Tetro. My address is 13310 72nd Terrace, Seminole, which is in the unincorporated Seminole, better known as the Harbor View subdivision. I've owned my waterfront home on Boca, Boca Siega Bay since 1987, and it was built in 1969 underneath the floodplain level established after Hurricane Agnes. I sent a letter to all of you six months ago making you aware of an ongoing issue I was having with Pinellas County Utilities and risk management. This is about a severe sewage backup in my home on September 11th, 2017, the day after Irma hit Florida. The description of what happened is addressed in the June 2019 letter I sent you. I also sent a zip file video of me walking through the sewage in my home that, the next day. I've hated, waited for a response from somebody and haven't heard a thing. That's why I'm here. This is not the first time this has happened to my house. I believe it's the fifth or sixth time this has happened. Risk management knows about my problem and in the past years have paid to repair my damages. This time they declined my claim. Fortunately, in the past, I could usually contain the backup to one large room in my house because I was always there when it happened. Because Irma was forecasted to bring flood surge, I evacuated to higher ground for the night and in the morning I found the spillage went through my entire home and was still flowing when I returned. I've lived in a Harbor View since 1984, have, well, was always assured each time this happened that, that PCU fixed the problem and would not happen again. Over the years of living on the water, I've seen evidence of sewage on the surface of the bay I believe this happens more than we know. Near Millennial Park, Millennium Park are some manholes near the mangroves from the original old sewer lines. They're along the bay. This may be where it's escaping from. I'm getting tired of being the canary in the coal mine every time the lift station malfunctions. I'm still repairing my home damages. I just redid my bathroom, ripped out the tub where the sewage came up, just finishing it this month. I have to do, I do have more to do as I am self-financing as I can. I believe the list station on 125th Street is inadequate. I have nightmares thinking about the tides development. Application is working through the county now looking to put almost 300 homes on an elevated ridge above my house. Think about the 900 toilets that will be flushing first thing in the morning every day if this project gets approved and utilizes the same lift station. I'm a Pinellas taxpayer who's paid hundreds of thousands in property taxes. I ask that you review my letter at my video and review my damage report written up after the storm by a public adjuster. I have a large file and history of the problem. I just got one more paragraph. <laughs> Finally, I see the county voted to buy the Bay Point golf course in the last meeting. That's a good thing. I went to the meetings when the first developer, Taylor Woodrow, applied to develop the tides and got turned down. If this new application gets turned down again, I suggest you consider buying this piece of land and add it to the <coughs> beautiful waterfront park already next door. Thank you, Mr. Teacher. I remember the legacy Please, left right when your board members, Commissioners John Chestnut and Chuck Rainey gave the county beautiful parks for all of us, our grandkids and great grandkids to enjoy. And remember you are standing on their shoulders. Thank you. Thank you. So let me address this. <coughs> Okay, last but not least, David Ballard Geddes. Thank you, good afternoon. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Based on Pinellas County ordinance and resolution, the county has been sold to the Water District in a 30-year foreclosure process commonly known as a fee simple title in statute law. Over the next few years, the functions of the county supporting the county's ad valorem property tax lien will be slowly placed under water district control and the county shall be dissolved and, as assumed, the water district shall rise into power, shape-shifting the government from a land-based to a watershed operation. The county and its stakeholders are to be embodied with the womb of 
are to be embodied within the womb of the district and after a gestation period, the county is hoping to be rebirthed as water jurisdictions under the 14th Amendment, reconstituting itself as a new nation seen in Statute 373.715, intent on directly levying upon the civilian population despotically in the formulation of a poll tax as enumerated from Article 1, Section 2, taking liberty, property, and life of the Gentiles, again, claimed as process due, chartered as due course of the county, thus eroding our current government in order to elevate the watershed government, revealing our current constitution as a cover-up operation, a medium seen as a useful art for limited times in Article 1, Section 8, used to aggregate to capture the water supply and vanquish Christianity as revealed in the reclaimed water variance application exposing the underlying will and intent of our current constitution, the Declaration of Independence in perpetuity, serving as preamble to Hamilton's second constitution, calls our current government an arbitrary government, a candid world, pretended legislation, wanting both its goose and its gander, wanting both its cake and its quid pro quo too. The stakeholdings of the county want to transfer governmental function and power using a fee simple title stemming from the Magna Carta, giving rise to an unstable de facto despotic built up act of legislative bulwark laundered on political dissension, using Roe versus Wade to express the false fact unwarranted findings in its birthing of a body politic under the 14th Amendment, bridge trolling rebellion in its long train of reasonably beneficial, unjustifiable stumbling logic. As a solution, in order to maintain peace and sensibility, the county, as sold, shall remain embodied within the district. The rebellious nature of the 14th Amendment shall be held illegal and void. The district levy shall be repealed and replaced as a tax lien. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I'm just assuming that we'll get some follow-up from some of the issues that were brought up today. The one item is a personnel matter, so I don't intend on addressing that. Um, the other issue, we will certainly follow up with the gentleman directly. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Next up is the consent agenda. Do we have anything that needs to be pulled? Yes. 15, please. 15. Okay. <coughs> Um, approval on the balance. Number, right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, do we have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Eggers and a second by Commissioner Justice. Can we have the voting card? Anybody have it? Yet? I don't. No. Okay. Just tell him yes. Um, I'm a yes. I didn't no. get it. <clears throat> that was unanimous. Okay. Item 15. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is a, um, a purportedly a five-year, seventy-four million dollar contract for the county, and I thought it might be us and perhaps folks who might be watching to learn a little bit more about this contract um, and uh, the relationship we have with Birdsall Boss and Associates, who is the recommended company. And just had a, a few questions, but maybe somebody could come forward and talk a little bit about this deal and uh, uh, why it is good for Pinellas County. Well, uh, if I can just uh, start, because I was going to do that later in the agenda, which is to introduce Steve Hayes, <laughs> who's coming up to answer your question. So Steve is our new um, our president and CEO of uh, Clearwater Visit uh, St. Pete, Visit St. Pete, and, um, and brings a tremendous background um, for the public. He uh, formerly was the, had the same position in Pensacola, um, and before that was part of Visit Tampa. Uh, for 20 some years so he has a tremendous amount of experience in this area and in the tourism uh, industry and so we want to welcome him uh, as as part of our team and now he can answer absolutely welcome questions. by the way thank you, <laughs> thank you sir. welcome so specifically just maybe talk a little bit about this contract um, 
It's a 12-year relationship, I understand already. Um, you've only been here just a short period of time. I'm assuming you've had enough time to go through and be comfortable with this contract, but maybe talk a little bit about the industry in general that, that does this kind of marketing and, uh, and talk about maybe why this, this group elevated itself a little bit higher than others. Um, and then I had some specific questions about other things that I'll ask you about after that. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, so in the, the destination marketing world, I mean, there's a multitude of messages that we're wanting to get out about a community and a destination. Uh, BVK has been involved in this process, um, I think you said, for the, the last 12 years. And I think one of the, the, the things with it is they understand what we have here in working with us um, and, uh, and, and helping shape what that, that message is. Um, the process is, uh, is going through and, and they open this process up to see who else may be interested in pursuing this contract. Uh, there were five, or, uh, five other businesses uh, that uh, presented out of the five, two, the top two were brought back uh, to do presentations. They did presentations um, of that and if I, and then I just re-looked at the numbers, uh, BBK was quite a bit ahead of the uh, second place firm. Um, and again, I think if you look at what they've done for us as a community, um, and as an organization and as of an industry, they have knocked the ball out of the park. And, you know, administrator brought, I came in from another community. Um, I was always envious of what was being done here in Pinellas County, some of the innovative things and some, some of that messaging. So uh, the ability to work with them, I was certainly looking for, uh, forward to that. But the, the, again, it's a very competitive process. Uh, again, five companies narrowed down to two with one being chosen from there. So being a short timer, you're still comfortable that this is the organization you want to, to lead your marketing efforts for the next uh, five years? Uh, yes, sir. In fact, we had a meeting um, God, probably two weeks ago where we brought that team in and with our team um, and really walking through what happens next in, as far as messaging and then even looking ahead to next year and what we want to do and what direction we want to go. That was very productive. And then we have a second meeting where we're getting all of our entities that help tell our story together in the same room, looking at long term, what do we need to do? And as far as the, uh, the contact person, do, we have, do they have account managers and do we have a, a person that you know has that day-to-day -day relationship that, that goes on? Just tell me a little bit about how that works and how they how they manage our account and that kind of thing. So you have you know a a day-to-day um, -day person. Um, as I look at you, if you want to call them up and say, "Hey, I need to check this out," or "I want to go in this direction," then can take that back to the team, and the team being not only the creative but also the media. Uh, buyer, things along that line. In addition to that, um, you have a dedicated media buyer. That's someone that's out searching for the best way to get our message out there. That gentleman, um, I know, has been on our account for a while. Um, you also have in um, um, other staff that are there that they can pull into the equation um, and looking at what we want to do in addition to consulting with our own staff. Again, it's a collaborative effort to make that happen. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that we need to grow things from the staff and, and be able to tell them, hey, here are things that we're looking at. What's the best way to make that happen? whatever direction that might be. Again, you know, we look at them as being experts to help provide that direction, but also to kind of challenge us if we get into, uh, you know, a certain rut on, on how we do something that might be creatively different, that again, we'll have a great ROI on what we're doing. And then maybe finally, if you could just talk a little bit about how these companies earn their fees and what kind of fees that they do earn. How, how, are, how, is, their, how is their compensation structured and is this pretty standard in the industry so if you could just share that a little bit yes sir the, so um, you know, from from that standpoint there are a number of different ways that you can go through and look at how you would go to fund and work you know and working with an, an ad agency some of them go through and they operate off of a monthly fee combined with a commission some of them go uh, total monthly fee uh, some of them go by by project um, I believe on this one, if, if my memory serves me correct, on this one we have uh, an agreed upon rate um, with them as an organization of what they're going to go through and, and do with us. And, it's, and, uh, and I believe there's a not to exceed amount with that. And I, again, I could be wrong. It's a little more detailed than I think I was prepared to talk about today. 
Um, but I'm comfortable with that process. Again, I think part of it with them in, in, or in working with them and staff is that we want to be able to utilize their services without you know, feeling like you're being also nick, nickel and dime and you're getting the best return on your investment and getting our, our message out there. Well, I think you, you, presumably we did the, the check with the industry, so that's, that's the most important thing. And if you're comfortable with it, I think that's also important. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do think it's a big contract for our county and for and for you all. It makes up a quarter of your, of all of the TDC funds that are that are brought in. So I think it's a big deal. Uh, I just thought it'd be important for folks to better understand a little bit about what goes on behind that uh, behind that organization. So thank you for your for some of your time. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Long, thank you, and thank Please you. Please remember for to use your request to speak button. What? request to speak just and tell us we were back on that program we're on it from now on okay from last meeting on. duly noted thank you thank you for being here Steve to answer these questions one of my concerns uh, along the way as we've been uh, in the hiring process was whether or not we were going to continue to keep our agents that we have around the world working on our behalf. And for those of us that have had the opportunity to actually go to the World, Wa um, world Water Conference, I've got that on my brain, World Travel Conference, I just want to put a unbelievable A-plus next to Marion's name. I don't know if you probably haven't had the opportunity or maybe you had to meet her yet, but... I hope she continues to stay with us because her ability to uh, gauge the marketplace for us was uncanny. And I think those folks are really, really valuable, having met many of them. And I hope that this contract, I think it does, because I see it in here, will continue to keep them with us, correct? Um, so let me go back. The, we have an agreement with, example, Marion in uh, Germany, and also handling Europe, but then also Vanessa in, in the UK. And those are separate agreements that we have. And yes, we are keeping that. And I do know Marion. Uh, strangely enough, uh, and this goes back, uh, well, let's just say a number of years ago, uh, and we were going after a German airline, and uh, and I was over in uh, in Germany not only with. Uh, um, at the time, I think it was uh, even DT, but Marion was the one taking us around and amazing how many people that she knew and how important sh those relationships are in, in developing business. So Absolutely. Yeah, what, so about, are, what about the lovely um, young woman who does this, our South American uh, folk, uh, contracts? Do you know who I'm talking about? I can't recall her name. Well, we have staff. Um, that handle uh, handle Latin America with Anna, um, and then okay. she and she works directly and going after the Latin American. So business. my point is, their contracts are with us, or their contracts are with BBK. They they, they are with us. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Entertain a motion. Well, move to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. There's a motion from Mr. Long, oh. and a second from Commissioner Peters. Commissioner Peters, I knew that. So, but I was drawing a blank. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're going to start using that next meeting, where we're <laughs> actually going to make a motion on there. The motion piece. Okay. Yeah. Well, my question is, I'm assuming that this has come up before the TDC, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. well, I didn't, nobody said, so I'm just asking. Yes, this has come before the TDC. Okay. So, so the last question I had was, so we are going to be using the same account manager, or has that changed? Yes, we are. Okay, same, same well, person. Okay. Well, wow. Well, this is um, what that the, did come up at the TDC. Yeah. So, um, now, what does our that Our account mean? manager was Mary DeLong, who you may recall. Right. And... Um, it's my understanding that we made the request to have a new account manager. Expected. And um, several TDC members, along with myself, expressed our dismay about that. Um, and so I believe 
I'll turn it over to either Steve or Barry, and you can give an update where we are with that now. Well, wow. I forgot to mention her. If I could just weigh in, I forgot to mention her, but I assumed, because I saw her name on here, that she was going to be our person. Is that not true? Well, go ahead. Would, go ahead, Steve. So our day-to-day -day contact um, is a uh, lady by the name of, I forgive me, I remember her last name, Victoria. Um, and so that, that is one of the changes we have on the account. So we still have some of the other creative folks and other media folks and what have you. But as far as our day-to-day, -day, that'll be Victoria. But when, one of the things that staff had done as part of that process of salary is this an opportunity we've we've had kind of that same team in place uh, for a number of years to have maybe a different fresh look. Simultaneously, though, Mary received a promotion within the company. And so uh, Steve has met with them. Um, I think you've met with the president of the company or yes. either you or previously, Paul Sacco, uh, regarding making sure there's a small uh, a strong transition. So she will still be involved. Um, and then there'll be some type of a transition period as she assumes other duties within the company. Okay, well, I don't know how I feel about that, quite frankly, after all the shenanigans that have gone on with this particular contract. And um, I would like to know that we absolutely are going to have her input on this contract. So when you say for, for Mary's input on the contract? Yes. As far as my conversation with BVK, you know, um, while Mary not be our day-to-day -day person, she still is a, a member of that company, and as that, they would consult with her, especially in, from my perspective, if there were anything historical to know about or any ideas, you're going to pull in your whole company <laughs> to make sure that you are doing the things necessary to be successful uh, with what we're doing. Yes. I was just looking for the uh, under the core team members here, looking for Victoria. I didn't, you didn't have the last name, but I didn't see a Victoria there. So, you know, the companies are deep, so I don't know where she would Most show up. Most of the up. team is turned over. Most what? of this team is turned over. That I. Yeah. So Victoria's new. She has been with the company for a while. Okay. I believe she was on the account previously. Okay, this probably isn't the right venue to be having this discussion, and I certainly am not as involved with the TDC this year as I have been in the past. But in my opinion, just my personal opinion, this is an awfully large contract that has been enormously successful for our county and for mm -hmm. everyone in it has benefited from the folks that have been working on this contract. So now to change horses right in the middle of the stream is just, I, I don't, I just have a big problem with that. I'm sorry. Just me. Well, it, if I could just say, it's not, not necessarily a bad thing to change account executives in an advertising and marketing firm to get some fresh ideas. You still have the same leadership of the firm that's guiding the whole thing, but you want to have some new ideas every once in a while, too. Absolutely. I, I appreciate that, too. But well, the entire team is well, changing? And, and if, I can just, if, I, if I can just add that some of the turnover that occurred occurred after that original conversation about new ideas. And so because of the amount of turnover within with people leaving the company or whatever, that's when they reached back out to the company to discuss making sure that Mary was part of that, to have that historical background to make sure, in fact, we didn't lose uh, that perspective. And so you know, part of that was not, it was an iterative process. This occurred over months and months and months. So the, they still feel very comfortable with the team. They feel still feel, still feel very comfortable with the contract. Uh, I know that was discussed at TDC, and it, it, that's still the recommendation. So I just had one other question then. I'm sorry. But when I was thinking about that marketing contract being $74 million, which I, I think of as, as a marketing promotion mm -hmm. contract, and then some of the questions that were asked, uh, some of the additional relationships that we have around the, the, the globe are separate contracts, and yeah. those are more promotional 
um, and slash marketing, um, and they are a, in addition to that seventy-four million, and they're directly with us. That is correct. And in that case, like uh, with the U uh, Germany as an example, it is more sales oriented, although there are some marketing elements to it. So they are the ones that are our eyes and ears in those countries. Um, and then they will also recommend marketing opportunities to reach, whether it's the travel trade or uh, the consumer in those respective areas. So the 15 million that you're talking about with this organization per year is the creative piece and maybe uh, production of the pieces that gets distributed out? Is that? Yes, sir. And in addition to buying the media, whether it's digital, whether it's print, what, I mean, whatever that medium is, but also if there's any activations and the creative behind that. So again, from a standpoint, they are the, they are the, um, they develop the look and the feel and the message, and then how best to go implement that in one area. We have a separate pot together that goes out on the digital side or PR side. On the sales side, that's where we have dollars set aside to go out in, in the case of Germany as well as the UK um, or what we're doing in Latin America. So it's, be, it's beyond the dollars that are going to BBK. Okay, um, yeah, it, sometimes that's probably, you should, not ask too many questions. The more questions I ask, the more I have. Um, and so I get a little bit, and again, I'm not, I'm not really diving into this contract as much as maybe the overall process. And um, I'm intending to come to more meetings this year and to listen to more of the meetings that go on. Uh, but uh, to me, it's almost like, can we, it, does this have to be decided today? Or is this something that we can bring back and just have a presentation a little bit more on the, on what goes on behind the, that marketing curtain that I frankly don't understand. I mean, again, I understand a little, but, um, or are we, is this time sensitive like it has to be done today? Um, let's look them back to Jill. Good afternoon, Jill Silverboard, Deputy County Administrator. We've already extended our existing contract um, with BBK. So in terms of the time sensitivity, um, we would prefer to move forward. Um, this is our recommendation. But if that's something that the, the majority of the commission would like for us to do, we can go back and ask for a different team configuration. Um, if you want to simply understand more about how post-contract um, the work will actually be handled to the point that Steve was just making, we can, we can provide you with that you know, at any time. And I, I know some of you have been on the TDC, you probably know it better than we do, for sure. Except this just happens to be the largest contract. And, it is. And, and there's other contracts, apparently, mm -hmm. that up that number significantly higher so this okay yeah but we've gone through the process we have a uh, a winning bid and we're not going to change that here i do understand the the need to have some more information or the desire to have some more information about what we do spend all that money on mm -hmm. so i think a presentation would be great maybe a work session um but well, and I think, um, and by the way, I don't think that we need to be micromanaging this team. You know, we're, we're contracting with the firm. I don't think we should sit here and try to dictate to them who ought to be on that team. Um, you know, the TDC had some input into it. We, well, they, <laughs> they had some comments on it. They, they, I'll, say, I'll put it that way. Wow. Um, the, the TDC Sorry. was, the way that we did the procurement, um, TDC members were welcome to attend the presentations, but we could not rank. And that is proper protocol, and, and some of us were there. Um, I will say that, in my opinion, when the, the team that presents their plan for the county, you're assuming it's the same team. Mm. So this is not the same team? Is that what you're saying? Nope. Not at all. And so that was where the TDC members, and we also went over, I want you to know, through the entire budget this year, we went department by department and really delved into it, including the BVK. So there was a lot of input from the rest of the TDC members and a lot of clarity. 
and a lot and and some you know we're not sure we should be spending money in this area that's the first time that we've done that deep dive in a long time i bet so, it was an eye opener too pardon me i bet it was an eye opener it really was uh -huh. and so that's where the marketing subcommittee also then came into play to follow up on other recommendations later. But it was during the, um, I believe, the November subcommittee meeting that um, Paul, I didn't know this, and Paul announced that there was going to be staff changes at BBK. And so I um, mentioned it to Barry. It, and then at the December TDC meeting, like I said, several people expressed their dismay. Madam Chair, can you please use the system? Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Long. Thank you. Uh, I hate to be ornery and um, disgruntled here, but I would, I would really like to hit pause for a moment until there's some questions that I have that I would really like to be able to have the opportunity to speak to somebody about them. I know it's a new day, Steve, and you're getting your feet wet on all of this stuff, but I have some real concerns about this changing of the team. And I recognize, I mean, I have a long history working with advertising agencies. I get the desire for new and fresh and all of that. That said, there are some, we are a public entity and we have responsibilities to folks other than, um, anyway, I just would like to get my questions answered before we move forward and sign on the dotted line. That's just my opinion. I'm just Mr. saying. Mr. Uh, do, do you want to withdraw your motion? I do. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. thank you. Mr. Justice. <sighs> Well, for, first off, what's our out? You know, if, if, if the company that we have is with any vendor, with any contract, that the work is not satisfactory, is that an annual that we can get out of it with a 90-day notice or something like that? There's a termination clause within the agreement. Mm -hmm. I guess I've just, I've never heard anyone, I think that the work that the agency has done over the years obviously has been satisfactory for us. I don't know that it was specifically this one person who was the genius behind all of our ads over the last five years, 10 years. There's always gonna be staff turnover. There's always gonna be changes. Um, I've never heard before that we specifically wanted Mrs. Smith on this deal or we didn't wanna go forward. Um, that's, a, that's a looking at a contract level that I've never seen before on this board. Um, that I think the only, it, again, it came back through the TDC. Sure. So that's why I'm mentioning it because there was, um, you know, there was a presentation um, for this RFP and um, the rankings were done. And then after the recommendation was made, then our someone from our staff um, asked that the team be changed. It's not just one person. <laughs> Thank you. It's the whole team. I, it's all. It's me. almost everybody that was so on the team. Then would you that would you want to go back for a full RFP it's out it's again? Because it's really it's just the two. The the three firms were ranked substantially lower than the other two. There were two firms that were. Yeah. I mean, the first one was substantially higher than the second one, but then it's a significant drop off down to the bottom three. Um, I mean, I still think we should award this. So that's, that's my opinion. That's my question is. At What's least for a year to see how this goes. Um, and since Steve is new on board, that's my opinion. I mean, I'm hearing questions, but I'm not hearing a specific question that would be a reason not to go forward with the ranking that our staff has done. We have a 30-day notice period to cancel for convenience. Commissioner Eggers, just to answer your question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well... Uh, this is a $74 million contract, so I think we have the right to ask questions, period. So I don't, you know, again, I'm not saying I have, I, I found that many times in government that uh, us up here don't always have the right question to ask. There, there's a right question to ask, and I'm not saying that I always peg the right question, and, and, I've, and I've regretted that at times. And so when I, I'm asking some general questions about this contract, 
We've just had a major change in the last year in our organization for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I am so excited that you're here. Me too. And I don't I, want you to yeah, think this, this is has, about you. This is, Welcome. And, uh, and so, but, but, on the, but, but this, again, there's some dynamics going on. Um, there's a large dollar amount here, and I just like to understand it a little better. The, not only the technical parts of it, but, you know, I think everybody needs to know that we're scrutinizing things, and I don't think it's wrong for that. And so I'm, I would just like to wait, and I'd like to get maybe a, a, a little bit... I'm not saying go back for an RFP. I'm just saying maybe the next meeting, come back, give us a, maybe a 15-minute presentation on what's going on behind the marketing curtain so that we understand it a little better and how the players are, are, are working. Because there are changes in this industry. If they're any good, the people that we have hired are any good, they're going to be scar pulled away. I get that. But I'd just like to have a little better understanding for that. And hearing some of the issues and questions, I think, validates that ask. Okay. Oops. Yes. I just so, wanted to clarify so for the record, it's Victoria Simmons, and it is reflected in the materials that she is the lead contact. Okay. And you made a comment that it was not a staff decision? Well, no, they, they, when we said there, there were um, staff requests for changes for the entire team, that was not correct. That's right. That, that, was, that was the company's decision. It, our only discussion, which was between Paul and the president, was about uh, Mary, Mary. And, and, and her role. So that Correct. then then the other changes occurred, but that's that was not a county requested, and so then that created a bigger issue, obviously, for continuity. And so we wanted to make sure there was continuity between the historical perspective that Mary brought and the team, because more of the team members change. That is my understanding. I could be off on that, uh, but that is the understanding yeah. of the sequencing of no, events. That's my understanding, and I think that's what uh, Mr. Hayes was saying earlier about the transition meeting that he had yeah. uh, was specifically exactly. to that point. And to specifically to that point that Mary would be involved in those decision yeah. making. She's still part of the company. She was received a promotion as part of um, her company's decisions, um, and so she would still be engaged in making sure that we have a smooth transition um, and, and to this new team that's being built as irrespective of the decision made here. And Mayor, you're correct, and I was incorrect in that, but the staff asked that Mary be no longer the account manager. That created the ripple on the entire team. So, um, anyway, um, so the other thing that I'm going to suggest if you do wait is um, I think you could walk, go to each office and go over what their budget is and show them the specifics of what go, flows through the contract. That's exactly what we did when we went through the budget. Mm -hmm. And I think that would help you all understand better how this money is being spent. And you can also um, highlight the changes that we made in that contract from previous years. Okay. So it, hold on a sec. Um, so it's not a problem delaying it for a month, say, till you can brief everybody on? No, I think it's, okay. we can do that. See where you had something? Well, and I was just gonna follow up on the point that the chair already made. Um, like many of our contracts, this does have a 30-day termination for convenience in it. In addition, it also has the standard language that we insert in any contract regarding your fiscal obligation to fund multi-year contracts like this. Um, you are only obligated for the current fiscal year for which you have budgeted and appropriated these funds. This is a standard provision in all of your contracts that are of a multi-year nature. So there are multiple, actually, opportunities to terminate, should that be the will of the board. But just so you all are aware, that is standard language that's in all of our contracts and is present in this contract. Oh, I, oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I unfortunately timing is like oftentimes everything, and I have an, a, a meeting with you and the team in a in a week or two. So, so yeah, yeah, and I, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, but I was also <laughs> talking to some folks from O and B too because I wanted to yeah. try to understand all of these pieces. <laughs> so I'm a little bit maybe out of sequence here. So I apologize for that that we didn't do it sooner. But I do think if even if we pause, I, I mean, I, I don't see why we can't get around the floor in a, in a week uh, and make it happen so that we can get the, get back here and, and, and address it uh, and make the decision. Um, I'm not hearing horrible things. I'm not saying that. So I'm just saying I just need to understand a little bit more about what's going on with our new contract. Okay. Sure long. Okay. Oh, the next meeting is February 11th. 
Is that enough time? Yeah. That's enough time to get around and talk to everyone. Well, thank you. You all will need more than a half hour. That's what, that's what I'm yeah. saying. May, the next that's meeting is February 11th, you said? Yes. That's next right. meeting, so we can postpone it to then. Okay. Commissioner Long. Yes, I'm Steve. I just wanted to apologize because when we met, I did not have this information, so it kind of hit me, you know, at the last moment. Okay. Just FYI, <clears throat> not about you. Uh, I am we glad. Are so glad, glad you're to here. be here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the Penelope. Glad to hear that. Good. Thank you. <laughs> So move, uh, move. Oh, go ahead. Does he have a 30 day out? That's what. <laughs> <laughs> that was unnecessary. All right. So, do we need to make a motion to postpone to the next meeting? Yes. So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Eggers, second from Commissioner Long. You can put the voting card up. To have this at the next meeting. To have this at the February 11th yeah. meeting. Yay. <laughs> that worked. Worked this time. Okay. Most. Yep. It was unanimous. Item 20. Item 20 is an updated Allegiant operating and use agreement with St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. Um, and this was a result of um, a, a, a substitute, an update to the agreement that was inadvertently uh, had to be changed. A Scribner's error. Yes, Commissioner, um, oh, Commissioner Eggers, did you? Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, okay. I'll get it down. I'm going to be a pain. Well, I just, you know, again, I wanted to take the opportunity when having Tom in the house that uh, maybe just because, you know, I, 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 we've been hearing a lot from, I've been hearing a lot from a couple people about our uh, n noise abatement group, and maybe yeah. we could just talk a little bit about this, I think it's increasing, but maybe it's normal it amount of, of, normal of complaints, but also the number of scheduled flight times past 11. Not the ones that we can't do anything about, but it seems like we're getting more and more that are scheduling past 11, which is the volunteer uh, time. So okay. just if you could talk a little bit about that um, and maybe a little bit about the relationship with Allegiant. So okay. that's what this is all about, so. All right, certainly. Good afternoon, Tom Jewsbury. Uh, Airport Director, yeah, to answer some of your questions to provide an overview. Um, with the, uh, the rate of the complaints, uh, we have seen uh, the number of complaints go up over uh, year after year. Uh, this year we had, in fact, actually uh, 3,400 complaints. Now, to sort of put things in perspective, that uh, is representative of 75 households for Pinellas County, which is actually a, about a 25% reduction compared to 2017. Um, of those of those 75 households, uh, two households actually make up 82% of those complaints. But with that said, whether there were 75 households or 10 households, we're still gonna continue to do uh, the efforts that we can to try to minimize the noise impacts. And uh, the Noise Abatement Task Force and specifically uh, operation staff, Mark Sprague and his group have done an excellent job in trying to increase the compliance rate, specifically with Allegiant. We have the noise abatement procedures in effect that have taken years to develop with the FAA and the airlines. And um, we have seen a significant compliance. Um, in fact, the average for 2019 was as much as 90%. And in fact, this last December was a 98% compliance rate with the noise abatement procedures when they've been flying. So um, we're seeing uh, improvement. Uh, we're seeing achievements in that area. But if you compare the number of complaints, yes, those are up. Uh, a little bit about the voluntary quiet window that you had mentioned. Uh, that goes into effect between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. We work with the airlines to the extent that we can to try to discourage them from scheduling flights, especially after 11 p.m. at night. Um, in fact, in the 58-page operating agreement with the Legion Airlines, it's actually on the second page, which puts them in a position to work with us to try to ensure that compliance when they can. Um, we see the uh, scheduled flights within that voluntary quiet window go up more pronounced uh, during the peak season, the travel season. Right now we have approximately 1,600 flights um, a month. And of that, this month, uh, there's four flights that are actually uh, outside 11 o'clock. Now when we get into the, uh, the March months, we do see that go up 
It could be as much as, say, on average, a flight, flight and a half a day. Um, uh, we're going to be going out uh, meeting with the executives um, to try to, uh, uh, well, several things, but one, uh, one thing on the agenda is, again, to put pressure on them to try to um, do a better uh, compliant rate when it comes to the voluntary quiet window. It's just when you increase the capacity or more so the frequency of flights, especially during those peak periods, there's going to be that time where you are going to see some flights that um, that push into that quiet window. But that there is constant communication with them throughout as far as trying to, again, put that pressure on them. So the uh, FTA controls a lot of things uh, it, it, with with our air, airport. Um, but as it relates to our relationship with Allegiant and when they when they land and when they when they schedule landings, do we not have more say than just like please do better? Um, or is it pretty much that it? I mean, well, to be quite frank with you, um, the FAA prohibits us from imposing any type of curfew or restrictions on the airlines. So, um, no, I don't have a big gavel to, to throw down. That's why we value um, the relationships we have with the Legion. It's not as if we talk to them once a year. Uh, we meet on a regular basis with the chief pilots. Uh, in fact, the Legion's even made a commitment where they fly their chief pilots uh, from their headquarters in Vegas to our noise abatement task force to participate, to hear, to try to, again, uh, increase at least some of the compliance with the noise abatement. But, um, okay. yeah, we will, again, we'll continue to do what we can with that pressure on them. And then just had one final question. Okay. Yeah, one final question, that is um, you have a, a, a large capital project coming up that's going to change the, the landing patterns, I guess, in the, as you pay, repave the runways? Okay, specifically you're talking about um, a rehabilitation project we mm -hmm. have at the pavement for a primary runway, 1836. Yes. We have to, there's sort of three primary phases where we have to shut down portions of the runway and we displace the, the threshold, the landing point and takeoff point for the aircraft. Uh, so there will be a point when we have to shut down the center portion of the runway, which renders it closed. And at that time we'll have to, for about, I believe it's just under three months, about three months, we'll have to utilize runway 422, which is our secondary runway, a little closer to the neighborhood of Feather Sound. This is something that we've communicated, working on a media campaign to okay. sort of educate them, let okay. them know it is a temporary measure. But even with that temporary use of 422, we've been working with uh, both air traffic control and Allegiant to try to sort of modify certain noise abatement procedures again, try to, to alleviate the noise to the extent possible. That was my next question, so you answered it. Okay. We're, we're getting the word out to people that there will be a change. Yes. And the time We've been period. doing it in workshops, but okay. we're also going to have more of a media campaign, okay. getting their newsletters, and also <laughs> countywide. Yeah, I just want to commend your, your, your staff and your, and your committee, too. They're really doing good work, okay. but I, you know, I sure think that. sometimes it's, you know, there's a lot of people out there, you know, deservedly, you know, wanting to know more about what's going on. So thank you. Appreciate the, uh, That's your time. Absolutely. Yes. Can I ask a question? We got a very yeah. detailed set of alternate minutes from the last meeting, and one of the, lots of data, but one of the data points had to do with, um, I thought, unless I was reading it too quickly, general aviation and Coast Guard and maybe even Sheriff's Office. Mm -hmm. I think um, what the, the and point. That, and that a lot of the noise had to do with that and not Allegiant. And do we, do we have any control over what they do? Again, yeah. no. 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 We no. don't. No, no okay. but it doesn't well. say that we don't have uh, influence on in what they do. Mm. Um, you know, we made a commitment to the board and a commitment to the community that we are, we are their advocate in trying to reduce the noise and put the pressure on them. Um, predominantly, the noise complaints we receive, um, I don't have the percentage, but it's up where like probably at least 80% is related to airline traffic. Um, not as much so with general aviation or Coast Guard because they're not the biggest noise contributors as far as the type of aircraft. But we do work with the tower. They do sort of what's referred to as like a fanning procedure when they depart. They're not departing over the same area. They'll have three different ones sort of to spread the pain, if you will. Um, they do not utilize the noise abatement procedures that we have for the airlines. And the reason is there's so much coordination effort uh, between our tower and Tampa Tower before those planes can release. They're actually merging in the sky, if you will. So to put 100,000 more operations a year into that, that we, we won't get the support from the FAA. Don't push her along. Thank you. And my, uh, I have comments more than a question mm -hmm. because 
I am very aware that, you know, there's so much air traffic in our region that um, it is, it, and I'm in a flight path where I live, and so I have been, all of us in my little subdivision have been very aware of the increased air traffic, and I do uh, think that it's not all about a legion, because I know the F-16 pilots have been training at McDill and on their way over to Avon Park, and when they fly over, I mean, it's screeching, screaming loud. On top of that, there's um, the Coast Guard has had a lot more planes in the air over the last couple of months. I'm not really sure what that's all about. And the sheriff's office has been with his helicopters late at night with that, uh, what do you call that thing, that spotlight that comes right through your window. It'll wake you right out of a dead sleep. I'm not kidding. Seriously. So all of that, you know, combines to make people very aware when there's an uptick in air traffic in our area. Right, yeah. we're very sensitive to that. Yep. Yeah, just I think it, uh, someone said that there was like 40% of our flights is what we're dealing with on this noise abatement. And, and the rest of the flights really don't kind of, they're not scrutinized because we just can't. Um, so we're, t we're dealing mostly with commercial airlines on the flight pattern. and, uh, and compliance and, with the noise abatement yeah, procedures. Yeah. But there's still other outreach with the Coast Guard, with the, with the Army Reserve. Um, even with the Coast Guard, with their training missions, they only perform 30% of them at, uh, at PIE. The other 60% are performed elsewhere, Sarasota and Brook, uh, Brookville. Or Brook, excuse me, just for the purpose of um, like trying to spread the spread yeah. the noise of people. So it's yeah. just not as concentrated over right. Pinellas County. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, so do we have a motion for um, this? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Eggers, second from Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Tom. We have the voting card, please. Thank you. <coughs> okay, it's unanimous. Item 21. Item 21 is a six month social um, action funding agreement uh, for the 2020 decision package for community programs. If we recall, we, the commissioners added a decision package for 750,000. We mm. continued programs that were approved for a one, for, uh, that had a one year agreement for six months while we com developed a competitive selection process. As part of that competitive selection process, there was a recommendation for funding for three programs. That's the Arts Conservatory for Teens Workforce Development and Training Program, uh, the um, Perk Stars Program for Job Training and Employment, and job placement, and um, the area agency for aging for um, uh, home delivered meals. Move approval. Second. Okay. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Justice, uh, second from Commissioner Seal. I have a. Well, never mind. I'll ask it later. <laughs> I had a question about. Do, Jill, do you know? I don't see any human service people. We have oh. Daisy here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Daisy, Daisy's right here. Oh, there's Daisy. And sorry, I didn't get, give you a chance to speak I before. Oh, Lourdes wasn't but there I have last a question. week. Uh, Daisy Rodriguez, I'm new at this. Services, yes. Did the uh, self people put in an application at they all did. the solar people? They did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they weren't. They were not. It wasn't people. enough. Okay. Yeah. Just wondered. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Um, we're ready to vote. It is unanimous. Item 20. Where am I? Two. Item 22. Thank you. So, in agreement with um, a Golf Consortium for partial grant funding of Lake Seminole uh, Sediment Removal and Restoration Project in the matter $1.1 $1. million. Move approval. Second. A motion with Commissioner Justice, second from Commissioner Long. Any questions? Thank you, Commissioner Justice. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, we're ready. All right. Madam Chair? Yes. May, yes, sir. The vote card is, uh, is still up, otherwise I would push the request to speak button. But there we go. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I was out this weekend at the Lake Seminole Square condominiums, uh, which are right on the lake. And I was there with Mr. Rob Burns, who's in our environmental management program, 
and it's 30 or 40 folks at the condos that had lots of really good questions about this project on the Lake Seminole. And uh, I sent an email out, but I wanted to make you all aware that Rob really just handled every question really perfectly, uh, very even keeled, very professional. And the folks there asked really good questions. These were not kind of maybe some parochial questions that you get. These were really good questions about the project. So it was a, a great morning in Seminole. Good to hear. All right, item 23. It's a, resolu a resolution dedicating a portion of county-owned property um, being Taylor Park on 16th Avenue uh, as um, um, a public right-of-way. Hmm. Move approval. Second. Okay. Uh, <laughs> motion from Commissioner Eggers, second from Commissioner Peters, and we are no questions. Ready to vote. Okay, item 24. This is requesting approval and updated Medicaid public emergency transportation letter of agreement with the Agency for Healthcare Administration and an intergovernmental transfer program questionnaire to participate in the expansion of the PM PEMT program via the IGT. Move approval. Second. <laughs> This. What you said. I yeah. can exp I explain uh, if you want. But. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Seal. We are ready to. Any questions? Okay, item 25. It's a change order number three with polydyne for requirements of polymers for the wastewater treatment plan. And in essence, they're just using more than what was originally projected. Move approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Long. Second by Commissioner Peters. No questions. Okay. Item 26. These are revisions to the emergency medical services rules and regulations. Uh, they're specifically listed in your bullets, um, basically made, uh, uh, eight areas that they're requesting the changes on. Do we have any questions about these? That will entertain a motion. No approval. Second. Uh, thank you. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Seal. And we're ready. Okay. Oh. Okay. Item what? Twenty seven. What is that? Oh. Under item twenty seven, I recommend you approve staff's recommendation as set forth to you in the confidential memorandum of today's date. Move of approval. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Peters. Ready to vote. And Madam Attorney, do you have anything else? I have nothing else. Okay. Mr. Administrator. Uh, two reports now that I've already introduced Steve to you, um, uh, but the... <laughs> The, the first item I'd like to do is make an announcement. There'll be a memo to follow, and that's yeah. congratulating Kelly Levy on becoming our permanent um, public works director. Oh, yay. Okay. Good job. She's, she stepped in, and obviously, as a result of a vacancy, and has done a great job um, working across the different depart, uh, divisions out there. And so um, she's certainly been around and brings a lot of experience in the county. Um, but she'll do a great job in this position. We appreciate her her, her work. Congratulations. Yeah. All right. The second uh, item is uh, I would ask uh, Jennifer Brackney uh, with CareerSource to come up and provide you an update. This was postponed um, back <laughs> from several months ago, and uh, so we wanted to, to get that in as soon as we can. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I did, um, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here today. It's a pleasure to talk with you a little bit about the budget, quarterly budget update with CareerSource Pinellas. I have that information, and I also thought I'd give you a brief update about our organization, some workforce development activities, um, a compliance review update, and the Science Center update. 
So as you know, Curse Source Pinellas, our budget is about $10.9 million. We have our CFO, Steve Meyer, here with us today, and he can get us started if it's okay to invite him up just to talk to us about the budget, the budget modifications, statement of finances, our cost allocation, and our expenditure report. So if it's okay, I'll have him join me for a moment. Steve? Uh, right there. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, what you're seeing here is the budget modification that was approved at our November 19th uh, board meeting. Um, and I just want to go through some of the highlights of that budget modification. Uh, DEO awarded Career Source Pinellas a we owe a supplemental grant of $137,000. Uh, these grants are given out usually on an annual basis to supplement our WIOA spending. And what we used it for was for WIOA adult training. And as you can see, uh, there's a subsequent uh, similar reduction in the WIOA adult budget for the same amount. We also had an increase in the WIOA dislocated worker, and that's mainly a timing issue. Uh, we expected uh, training to be spent before the end of last fiscal year, and that rolled over to this fiscal year. So we're asking, we asked for an a increase in the budget for a dislocated worker for $400,000. That's what that item is. Uh, the Career Ready Sector Strategies IT, that was a, an original grant that ended on June 30th. Uh, we did have excess funds that Career Source Florida did grant us an additional grant for those unused funds to, to spend through the end of next month. Uh, we owe apprenticeship expansion and we owe soft skills. Those were $200,000 grants that were issued by DEO at the beginning of last year. Uh, we didn't spend uh, the funds during the fiscal year, so that's about 40000 carried over to this fiscal year. And then the Juvenile Welfare uh, Board of Pinellas County, we, we had a grant that uh, uh, ended and we didn't use all the funds there that we expected. So that was the budget modification that was uh, taken to our board and approved in November. Does anybody have any questions about that? So with that, on the next page, um, that is our statement of activities for the four months ended October 31st, 2020. Uh, the budget column that, that is shown does incorporate the budget modification that I just talked about. Um, as you can see, we had uh, revenue of about $3.4 million. Uh, budgeted revenue was $3.6 million. One of the things to keep in mind that most of our grants come through DEO and our, and our cost reimbursement, so really they're based, based on our expenses. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that we're about 186000 unfavorable. Um, but again, it's really based on the expenses. In the expenditure side, really, we're, we're doing pretty well, except uh, in the program expenses, we are uh, $1.4 million we've spent versus the $1.6 million. And, and that's really a, comprised of a few items. Uh, we have... A, a contract with Pinellas Education Foundation where they were underperforming at the beginning of the year. We've had meetings with them and they are been performing in November and December. So uh, that's one of the things. Uh, we've had a couple of, of other items. Um, the, work, the, the, the work base initiatives, uh, the on the job training as well as the employed workers uh, training. And what, what, what occurred there, if you recall, that was in the DOL compliance report and what we've done is we've put those a little bit on hold so we're a little bit favorable to the budget there. The other item, personnel expenses were favorable about $45,000. We continue to monitor our, um, our personnel costs and our, and our head count and Jennifer will talk about that a little bit in our organizational slide. Um, question. But every I have a question. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just looking at this, and you, you said a couple of times now where we didn't spend the money that we budgeted uh, on a particular program. Um, and I'm all about, like, saving money, so that's good. Uh, but um, is it something that we're just, uh, that a partner's not delivering on in, these, in some of these cases? Or, I mean, you mentioned yeah. one a minute ago, but is that the bulk of it? Yeah, go ahead. The Pinellas Education Foundation okay. is a subrecipient. They do uh, youth services. Um, so um, 
they started out slow at the beginning of the year and we realized that that was an issue so we Jennifer had meetings with them and uh, they have turned around they've gotten higher enrollment so our spending has been up in the last couple months so we continue to work with them uh, youth initiatives throughout the state is a challenge okay so it was it's a challenge or the people that are doing it just weren't stepping up. Yeah, Pinellas Education Foundation has always done a great job for yeah. us. So I think sometimes it's just a slow startup at the very first quarter and, and sometimes it takes a little time to catch up. So their enrollments we anticipate will be right on track as we move okay. forward and I don't anticipate any problems. We have a very good working relationship with them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to mention too that we that um, Career Source has a variety of um, grants that span different years, uh, right. different 12 month periods. So right. there's a lot of carrying money over mm -hmm. into the next fiscal year. If you're, you know, if they're, if the grant's on a calendar year and they're on a federal fiscal year, you know, there's yeah. just a lot of that sort of. All the WIOA accounting. grants are two year grants. Yeah. Right. And that's why we always do the budget modifications. We present those to the board so we always know where we are with those uh, budget activities. And we're constantly looking if we're, we're higher or lower in some categories, we'll look to, to reallocate during the course of the year. Okay. Anybody have any other questions on the, that high level statement of activity? Um, the next page is the cost allocation expenditure report. And really what this does is just show the different funding streams where we are through the, through the four months. And I just wanted to point out that we're about a third of the way through the year. The WIOA, Employment Services, Welfare Transition, which is WTP, SNAP programs are all about a third of the way through on spending what we budgeted. Uh, and that uh, of our spending, 68% uh, is direct and about 32% is, is allocated. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. And just to talk with you a little bit about our organization, we have uh, our organizational chart here. We're very, um, we've been working very diligently to put together a strong leadership team. Our CFO is one of those. We're very happy to have Steve Meyer on track with us. We also have an HR business partner, administrative assistant. All of those things have been put in place, and I feel really good about the traction that we have moving forward with 2020. So we've also promoted employee involvement and to assure equity and fairness and consistency within our organization, we've really implemented several initiatives. Those are outlined here, the engagement survey. We will hopefully do another one of those this year. We had our comprehensive salary and title review. Communication has improved. We have quarterly town hall meetings, newsletters that go out to our staff and to the community. We have performance evaluations that are now aligned with our program year, July through June, and we've implemented, implemented a new health and benefits program that went into effect in, in January. So in addition, we're reviewing our HR handbook and all of our desk guides and SOPs that are hopefully aligning us with our DEO and DOL policy and guidelines. Question? Yep. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, like, uh, if you continued this org, you would report to the board yes. and the the attorney that we've had often had a lot of conversation about reports to the board yes. separately okay that's yes. why that person's not in they don't work for you they work no. for the board they, they work you. for the board Thank and you. we have recently we have had a, a change attorney. yep in yeah. legal so you what I didn't we have a new attorney yes do we know who that is yes it's uh gray robinson is who we're working with and stephanie marchman is our contact who is uh, working with the board excellent yeah very good Okay. Uh, Commissioner Long. No, David asked my question. Well, never mind then. Thank you. And David did not push his button off. <laughs> Thank <now>. you. <laughs> See how he tries to jump in front of everybody. <laughs> I'm trying. He doesn't follow the rules. Sounds like somebody else I know. I'm trying. He's a rebel. Me too. All righty, just some workforce development activities as we move forward. We're in the process of doing our strategic plan for 2020. We're really excited about this. We have a strategic planning team put together, 15 board members, uh, stakeholders, and partners are involved with that, along with some focus groups that will look at employers, job seekers, participants, and employees. And then we are working on our local workforce development plan, which is due to the state, DEO, in March. 
and that will come before the uh, Board of County Commissioners here soon once it goes through the board. We have monthly career fairs. The next one is January 30th. We expect to have about 30 employers here. And we have a professional networking group which meets on a weekly basis. And we just recently opened two satellite offices in partnership with St. Petersburg College, one at Tarpon and one at Epicenter. So those, oh, go ahead. Yes. I can't find my button. <laughs> it's not on the screen. Now you gotta go back. Oh, uh, okay. There we go. Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> so these general career fairs, it yes. really are open to anybody, yeah. any uh, individual companies, the county, anyone, any government groups. Nope. Okay. Anyone. They're free. They're free to the public. They're free for employers to participate. Although we do encourage sponsorship from the employers, um, and we have had up to 50 employers, 300 job seekers come through. This is one of the things that we're really trying to rebrand, build consistency so that people know where they can come to connect with employers and job seekers and to connect those two together. So they've been very successful. It's a great partnership at Epicenter and with St. Petersburg College and some other providers. And how often do you do those? We try to have one once a month. Okay, great. Awesome. Yep. Yep. And the county's having a career fair, aren't we? Yes, but I can't tell you. Somebody down there could out. probably tell us about <laughs> it, but. Well. And then parallel to all of that, we continue to work with the compliance review, which was issued by USDOL. We submitted our last response on November 28th, and we are just right now in a holding pattern waiting for USDOL and DEO to get back with us. So hopefully we will continue to move forward with that project. It's been quite a project. Any questions? Last but not least, the Science Center. It has been sold. Yay. It was sold on November 20th. And as requested by the BOCC and um, our board of directors, we have set aside the proceeds of that just in anticipation of any potential disallowed costs that come out of the compliance review. How much did we sell it for? It sold for $3.1 million. Proceeds Harry. are about two point three that went into unrestricted funds and are put, have been put on hold just anticipation of where we're where we go with things very nice yeah all right okay that's all i have all right thank, thank, you. thank you thank you all right thank, thank you. you okay we have uh an appointment of the lpa by commissioner of justice yes madam chair i'd like to move to appoint uh matinea s john uh, as my appointment to the lpa move approval second <laughs> okay we have a motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Long. And that is unanimous. Okay. Does anybody have any new business items? Yes, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to bring this to your attention to see if there might be any interest. I know we had Paul Valenti here a little earlier in our meeting today, but um, it has not um, gone unnoticed by me that Hillsborough County and Pasco County have established a uh, human trafficking commission and Pinellas County has not. And their work is really being spurred by the um, opportunity for the Super Bowl to be held here in, in Tampa. And so I wanted to see if there might be an, an interest in, among my colleagues here to do kind of the same thing that they're doing and establish a commission and really be very active between now and the Super Bowl with our efforts. Because, you know, as much as we hear about this, um, I, I am curious about the indicators. There are some specific indicators that we all should be paying attention to with regard to this issue and I've never had any particular training on them, but I just thought it might be something for us to consider because especially with the optics of the Super Bowl coming and the awareness that this issue is getting with our law enforcement folks, 
I thought it might be something to discuss, and I've got a copy of the um, resolution. One of the commissioners from uh, Pasco County talked to me about it and wondered if we might be interested in following suit. So I bring that up for for discussion, if there is any, or just to gauge your interest. Well, if I could just say, I know that um, there is a task force locally that works on human trafficking. It includes the law enforcement agencies, the FBI, the provider community, and they've been working together for many years. I mean, for a long time, it was based at Clearwater Police Department. Now, I believe it's at um, St. Pete, but... Mm -hmm. They've, they're very effective. They've made many arrests in human trafficking. And in fact, we were, this area was in the forefront of dealing with human trafficking way before mm -hmm. Hillsborough or Pasco was um, because it's pretty high risk here. And because we've hosted Super Bowls before, um, I don't know how anybody else feels. I don't know if it's seeing that those people are working together, the ones that are actually on the street dealing with this. I'm not sure we need a commission to tell them how to do their work because I couldn't. But well, anyway, I'm, that's just my opinion. Um, Commissioner Justice, you had something. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, well, that would be my question is what, what would the, I mean, I think anything that we can do to bring awareness is good. It was at Clearwater and now St. Pete just got this big federal grant yeah, yeah. To, to do Same. stuff with it. Um, I'm for anything that we can do to highlight and this is probably the most horrific crime I think that exists today. I mean, just absolutely, I just don't know what the commission would actually do. But if it's bringing attention, I, I mean, I'm all for that. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm all for that too. But I also wanted to say that uh, SPC does regular training on human trafficking. They've trained a lot of direct service providers <coughs> in the county of all kinds. Um, oh. Commissioner Eggers, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's exactly what, what Commissioner Justice said is where I was going with it. I, I think this is one of the top things that we need to be involved in. I don't mean we, the commission, but we as a county. And so um, to, the, to the extent that um, I'd like to know more about those, uh, what, what those two counties are doing through this and what they provide additionally, perhaps nothing more, or maybe not even as much as we do, but just how we get involved, how we get engaged. Um, I, I still have this little stop human trafficking thing. I think Pinellas County did um, some time ago. It says Pinellas County on it. It's really kind of a neat thing. It talks about warning signs and, and questions to ask just right in front of our faces sometimes. It's, it's so horrific and scary. And, uh, but yeah, anything we can do I think would be awesome uh, to bring, like you say, awareness and, and, and promotion and, and that kind of thing in terms of what we are doing. We're serious about this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times our, those folks that do the work, they're serious about it, but oh, they're, they're doing serious. it quietly. <laughs> but maybe there's a little overarching thing that we can just, you know, you come to our county, you come and do this kind of stuff, the work, we've got people in place to, to take care of it. I don't know, I, I'd like to know more about it. Yeah, well, I'm, right. I don't believe the sheriff's office has a, a department that does just human trafficking, but I know they're involved. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering about our marketing department, if what we're talking about is raising awareness that maybe they could become part of that um, we do this? task force. That's what I was going to suggest. You know, they could do uh, wonderful you know, things contacting, there. Contacting um, St. Yeah. Pete and seeing if there yeah. could be Some a piece. PR piece that we could be helping with or, you know, look and see what the other counties are doing, but maybe ask... I'm off for trying to do it through an agency that already has a grant and has People resources and doing, that yeah. we could work with yeah. them. And one of the things that you can do with marketing is kind of create ways for victims to um, yeah. contact law enforcement or whoever to get away from what they're, what's happening to them. Barbara Hernandez, Director of Marketing and Communications. So we currently work with our departments and partners to get the word out through social media and through our regional public information network, um, where we have between 30 and 40 agencies throughout the county. Um, so we will, um, you know, take this topic again back and uh, continue uh, marketing efforts and then reach out to the task force. Great. And, and Madam Chair, if I may, Commissioner Peters has... Oh, sorry. Request. Thank you. My suggestion, Commissioner Seal kind of said the same thing already. I, I agree with you, Madam Chair, on what you said, but um, I think really, if we really want to get more information, we talk to the task force and, and go on their recommendations versus us starting our own. Right. I think it would be silly, so mm -hmm. good, good suggestion. Thanks. 
But if we want to learn more, we can also ask them to, yeah. either them or SPC to do a presentation for us. Right, and so my, just to be clear, my suggestion was not to create a, a new entity or something like that, but more to, for us to focus uh, greatly on it between now and when the Super Bowl comes to this area. I know we're not doing nothing because I have a daughter-in-law that works on that task force, but I do think that there's a lot of opportunities to you know, raise the awareness, really bring some structure to the to how we get all that information out there and pro you know, be very proactive about it. So I can agree. I is is it okay to continue with my notes? Sure. It's okay. Um, I just wanted to let you know, I think I may have mentioned it before, but I don't know if we've met since we had our last T Barta meeting. But we, I am beginning in the very early stages of putting together a transportation summit for the end of the year for our region, similar to what we did with the um, climate change and sea level rise resiliency conference that we had. It'll be a two-day summit, and it'll be hosted by T. Barta, and Commissioner Seal can give the rest of the T. Barta report. I know she will. Uh, our first not giving um, meeting reports at do this what? meeting anymore, but oh, okay, this is just new business. Okay, so well, new business then. Our first <laughs> board that was new business. That was new business. And the first board meeting for PSTA is uh, tomorrow. Just right. FYI, in case anybody wants to know, right. and. Um, yeah, well, the rest of my report is for our next workshop. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other new business? Yes, Commissioner. Um, just two things. Um, I I kind of echoed Commissioner Long's comments on an email string last night, but my reaction when I read oh, Raheem's yeah, I forgot to mention uh, that. message yes. was like, oh, no. <laughs> Oh no! You I know. know. Don't go, please. Don't. Go. I am so Say sorry to itself. have you leave us, and um, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you did for the county. I always had the utmost confidence in you, and um, all the details and everything that you did, professional integrity. You know, much was echoed by the rest of the commissioners in their emails last night. <coughs> I just want to know where I can send a bad recommendation to, so maybe get that, I know. that job was kind of revoked. My reaction. <laughs> I think the rain's going to take care of it. You know, he'll be back here. He'll be sorry when it's got when he's got, surrounded freezing by five feet of rain. snow and he's freezing well, to death. I don't think they get snow and. And then the only other thing is, I just wanted the citizens to look out. Um, these will be available shortly at city halls and libraries and public places. This is very well done this year. It arrived in the Tampa Bay Times, and it truly lays out what you should and should recycle. Mm -hmm. Easy to use. Um, good job. And I'm sure we have them around here somewhere, right? Because people probably threw them away like I did. Oops. Didn't realize it came. Madam Chair. Yes. Can we all please extend our deepest sympathies to Commissioner Welch on the passing of his sister last Saturday? He's had so much tragedy to deal with. I just ache for him. So. Yes. All right. Any other business for right now? We'll be back at six.